When people think of Putin, they think of power. Vladimir Putin has been ruling Russia since 1999. There hasn't been such a powerful leader in Russia since Stalin. He invaded neighboring countries, interfered in US elections, and even changed the constitution to stay in power until 2036. But that hasn't always been the case. Back in the 1990s, Russia was ruled by oligarchs, a group of people who amassed massive fortunes during the collapse of the Soviet Union. They controlled the media, had most of the politicians on their payroll, and even brought Putin to power. But when Putin refused to return the favor, the oligarchs waged a war against him. The Soviet Union sent the first man to space, developed the first ever satellite, and was the second largest economy. But things took a turn in the 1980s, especially after they got involved in a war in Afghanistan. That war cost them a lot of money and made their economy go downhill. The leaders in the Soviet Union tried to make their economy better, but it was too late. People in different parts of the country started wanting to be independent. And when the Berlin Wall came down, it was like a signal for other countries to leave the Soviet Union one by one. The Soviet Union's economy was huge, but it didn't work very well. Everything was owned by the government and they made all the decisions. So, if a factory made money, they had to give it to the government in Moscow, and then the government would give some back to the factories. But here's the tricky part. If a factory didn't spend all the money they got, the government would think they didn't need as much next year. So, factory managers would spend more than they needed to, and this happened all over the country. It led to lots of factories not doing well, the country owing a lot of money, and eventually, the Soviet Union fell apart. As the 1980s went on, the Soviet Union faced lots of big problems that would change its history a lot. They got into a tough, expensive war in Afghanistan, which made their economy and military weaker. Even though they did cool stuff in space and technology, their economy wasn't working well. The government controlled everything, which didn't let new ideas and hard work thrive. People in different parts of the Soviet Union started wanting to be on their own. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, it showed that barriers were coming down and countries in Eastern Europe were becoming independent. This change spread to the Soviet Union and it eventually fell apart. In the next parts of our story, we'll see how this led to the end of one era and the start of a new one with Vladimir Putin in charge. Russia had to move from communism into socialism overnight. The Russian government knew that they had to privatize all the factories across the country since they were a huge burden on the government's budget. But they also wanted regular Russians to get some good stuff out of this change. So they came up with a plan. They said, OK, we're going to divide these factories into three parts. One part will belong to regular people, another part will belong to the government, and the last part will be sold to rich investors. To make this fair, they gave out these special papers called vouchers to regular Russians. These vouchers were like tickets that people could use to get a piece of these factories. It seemed like a great idea, but there was a problem. Most regular Russians didn't really know what it meant to own a piece of a factory, and they needed money for things like food because they hadn't been paid in a while. So many people ended up selling their vouchers to the managers of the factories for a lot less than they were really worth. Instead of regular people getting a good deal, a small group of people took advantage of this situation and became super rich. The idea of these super rich people, called oligarchs, became popular later on when Russia's first president wanted to stay in power. At the time, things in the country were a mess and a lot of people blamed the president for it. Everybody thought he was going to lose the election, especially because the parliament was mostly controlled by the communists and they were pretty sure they would win. So, the president asked the richest bankers in the country for help. But these rich folks didn't want to help for free. They wanted something in return, a bigger share of the country's economy. To sell the rest of the companies that were owned by the government, the parliament had to approve it. And it was pretty impossible since it was mostly controlled by the communists. So they became creative and came up with a brilliant strategy and robbed the entire Russian government. You see, 
Russia's financial system was still immature back then, so government funds were deposited in commercial banks and mostly managed by them. Since the country was in chaos and Yeltsin desperately wanted to be re-elected, Russia's top bankers offered him a deal. The oligarchs would lend him $500 million with an annual interest rate of 150% and would take the government's shares in the biggest companies as collateral. If the government would not be able to pay back its loans, the banks would be able to keep these shares. Eventually, Boris Yeltsin won the election in 1996, but the government, as expected, wasn't able to pay back the debt. That's how a few individuals literally became the owners of Russia's largest companies. Vladimir Potanin, who was the mastermind behind this scheme, received the controlling stake in Norilsk Nickel, one of the world's largest nickel and palladium mining and smelting companies. It cost him $170 million, but today the company is worth almost $50 billion. And Potanin's net worth is $27 billion, making him the second wealthiest man in Russia. Mikhail Khodorkovsky received a 45% majority stake in Yukos, Russia's largest oil and gas company back then, for an estimated $159 million, which by 2003 was worth dozens of billions of dollars, making Khodorkovsky Russia's richest man with an estimated net worth of $17 billion. First, he got control of Avtovaz, which is a big car company in Russia. After that, he sort of sneaked his way into Aeroflot, which is the biggest airline in Russia, and somehow he ended up being in charge there too. Then, in 1996, he did this tricky thing and got Sibneft, which is a huge oil company. It's so big now that we know it as Gazprom. In just one year, Berezovsky and a few others made tons of money. They got so rich that they started doing some interesting things, like buying politicians and TV stations. They even tried to get total control of the government. When Yeltsin wanted to resign, Berezovsky convinced him to make this young KGB officer named Putin his successor. Putin acted like a perfect puppet. He guaranteed Yeltsin and his family the security he wanted and the oligarchs the favours they asked for. But something went wrong. Putin kept his promise to Yeltsin, but he began to consolidate power when he sat on the throne. Now that he is the one who is wearing the crown, the rules of the game have changed. It was time to show the oligarchs who the Tsar was. But oligarchs weren't ready to simply give up power. They controlled the media. They had billions of dollars and multiple politicians on their payroll. They wanted to let Putin know that it's them who put him on the throne and they can take it away if he is not going to return the favour. Gusinsky was one of the oligarchs who controlled NTV, the biggest TV channel in Russia back then, the newspaper Sagodnya, the radio station Echo of Moscow and a number of magazines. He was the man who controlled public opinion in Russia. Everyone knew that he was not someone to mess with. His media empire aggressively began attacking Putin and mocking him. His popularity began to decline as the media kept spreading bad news about him. Putin knew that if he wanted to rule Russia with an iron grip, he must first control the press. He launched an investigation against Gusinsky with the goal of putting NTV under the government's control and effectively silencing the opposition. Gusinsky was charged with misappropriation of funds and large-scale fraud and was arrested. Shortly after his arrest, representatives of the Kremlin proposed to Gusinsky to sell Media Most, his media empire worth a few billion dollars at least, to Gazprom Media at a price that Gazprom Media sets, which was just 300 million US dollars, in return for his freedom. Under immense pressure, Gusinsky signed the deal and immediately left Russia after being released. But Putin didn't stop there. He wanted to make Gusinsky an example for other oligarchs. Shortly after he left Russia, he launched a new investigation against Gusinsky and asked Interpol's head office in France to issue an international arrest warrant for Gusinsky's detention and extradition. Fortunately for him, Interpol's head office declined the Russian request, 
but the Russian government kept pressuring until the Spanish government arrested him and placed him under house arrest in Gosinski's home in southern Spain. Other oligarchs took note and decided not to mess with the new king and changed sides. Abramovich, Potanin, Deripaska and Fridman all surrendered to Putin in exchange for keeping their fortunes and freedoms. But not Berezovsky, the main person who was behind Putin's presidency. He controlled the second largest TV channel in the country. He was expecting huge favors from Putin since he was the main person who made him the president. But in return, the government launched an investigation into his business deals with Aeroflot. Then the government literally took over his media empire. He was forced into exile in the United Kingdom and lost all of his businesses in Russia. His last hope was to win a court case against Abramovich, his former partner, but now Putin's puppet, for $5.5 billion. However, he lost so his life ended tragically in 2013. Now that Putin took control of the media, no one could challenge his authority, except Russia's richest man back then, Mikhail Khodorkovsky. With a net worth of $17 billion, Khodorkovsky was confident that he could buy anything and make himself the man who would run the country behind closed curtains. In February 2003, at a televised meeting at the Kremlin, Khodorkovsky publicly argued with Putin, accusing government officials of corruption and accepting millions of rubles in bribes. The two men had completely different visions for the country's future, but only one would prevail. In early July 2003, Khodorkovsky's most important partner was arrested. The arrest was followed by an investigation into tax evasion by his oil and gas company, Yukos. On the morning of October 25, 2003, Khodorkovsky was arrested at Novosibirsk Airport. He was taken to Moscow and charged with fraud, tax evasion and other economic crimes. His company was entirely eliminated and he was imprisoned for the next 10 years. Not a single oligarch ever challenged Putin again. His power grew so much that it became impossible to imagine Russia without Putin. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more weekly investment tips. Leave a comment below. Happy investing!